Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Big Game Indicating Dogs Q&A. These Q&As are made from questions from people who are following the Deer Dog Training Blueprint from the Inner Circle page, that people that sign up to the Blueprint get access to the Big Game Indicating Dogs Inner Circle, which is a closed Facebook group, and in there people can ask questions. If you want to learn more about the Deer Dog Training Blueprint, Big Game Indicating Dogs, you can go to biggameindicatingdogs.com, you can go to Big Game Indicating Dogs on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube, and you can check it out there. Today's Q and A. It's 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 one of those ones that comes with that that I need to put a little bit of a warning on the front. Um, it's a biggie. We've got a couple of big questions in here. Um. <laughs> My first note is Dave. You're killing me on this one, man. <laughs> That's a hundred percent honest. And um, Dave's got a couple of massive questions here, really big, long questions. He's got two. The first question right at the start of this Q and A is from Dave, and it's about a thousand odd words. Um, it's a good sort of five minute read. Um, <clears throat> with about with several questions and points in the same thing. Often I break them down and rewrite them and simplify them, but there's like questions like this, but there's so much in here. And having said that, it's actually fairly well written and the way he's broken it down and structured it, it's actually fairly good. It reads fairly well. Um, but there's a lot in there, man. And the, the most difficult thing about this question or these questions from Dave is that I, I basically completely disagree with any... P- pretty much all points that he's made. I've got fairly blunt answers to all of the questions, which there's lots of them. And there's no way of answering any of this stuff diplomatically. And there's a lot of it. So the only way I can answer this stuff honestly is with a pretty long, frank, honest and necessarily blunt answer it's going to be a, 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 it's a, and that's it <laughs> and he's got two of them and the first one's a lot and the second one's about a two thirds the way through this Q&A and it comes on even harder um, you know <sighs> And the reason why I say you're killing me on this <laughs> is because I don't mind answering this stuff at all. I don't. The only thing I don't like about it is the way it can come across. But Dave has got the blueprint, and he's trying to train a dog. He's having problems. He's asked me some questions. He wants my opinion. So I'm going to give it to him and my opinion. And I think in these types of circumstances, it becomes even more important that I'm 100% honest. Um, and that's it. Uh, we've got a few here. Um, okay, uh, we've got two or three other pretty simple ones, but we've got we've got a lot to go over with Dave here. So let's get into it. Um, I'm going to read Dave's first question. I guess 
the main thing why I put these warnings on the start is is if I just rip straight into this and you just listen to what uh, particularly someone that's not familiar with the blueprint and the inner circle and all of my other Q and A's and all of that, and you just listen to me answer this and you didn't know much about dog training. Yet, or the way we do it and all that background and context, you'd just think, man, this dude. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the other thing actually that I want to put on the front of this is I've got a lot of notes on this, on Dave's. Basically, I've, aunt, I've got written answers here to everything, all of the questions that Dave has asked because there's so many, that some of these get very difficult to go through and answer off the cuff without going all over the place or and either A, missing something, leaving something out, really important, or B, it just going on and on and on. So um, I've got a lot of written answers here. I'm basically going to read through all of this, um, and I'll interject with off the cuff either not that much or probably, but probably quite a bit. Probably quite a bit. Question number one, <clears throat> Dave. Hi, Paul. Sorry about the rant. I have a heading dog pup 13 weeks old. 13 weeks. Very, very young. Okay, you're in, you're in, you're in week. At this point, you're in week. The first four weeks, part one of the blueprint, is basically management and we do no compliance training. We do linking sounds with actions and basically everything that we're doing there in that part one with regards to kenneling, long line, linking actions to commands and everything that we're doing is basically just getting as much of a head start on everything that we can with our pup and... Again, anything we do with regards to kenneling, training, linking actions with commands is all to make everything as, as easy as possible on the pup. You know, if we don't start separation training right from day one, that's just way harder later on. Um, if we don't use a long line with our pup out of the kennel, we're just setting it up to fail and setting up bad habits that are going to, that are going to be harder to sort out later on. So part one, again, no compliance training. So with a 13-week-old pup, you are in your first week of training. Just a bit of context there. <clears throat> she has settled into her kennel really well from day one. That's great. So we're back to Dave here. I'm the only one training her. I've let her play with my Foxy Jack Russell a few times. They interact and play well for 10 minutes every day or so. Foxy is not too dominant and plays nicely laying around sometimes and being re being relaxed and submissive. Nothing too crazy. Probably a 4 or 5 on your scale. So that's perfect. Is, and Dave asks, is this okay? That's totally fine. Um, totally fine. <clears throat> um, if you've watched the blueprint you know about freedom sessions and, and if you've listened to our Q&A so you know about freedom sessions with older dogs and the ins and outs and pros and cons of that that's fine so question number one, fine Dave says I do about four or five walks a day on the long line about 15 to 20 minutes it's a lot but it's not necessarily a problem but four or five a day is a lot which can be fantastic but it all depends how you deal with it. But that's one little flag here early on which could be a factor for the later issues. Four or five a day, two or three a day is great. You can do it with one a day and freedom sessions. Four or five, there could be some overtraining and too much repetition issues arising there. Just a little, just a thought. I do four or five walks a day on the long line for 15 or 20 minutes and she walks in front reasonably well. Sometimes I have to stand on the long line to keep her at three metres from me. She seems to pick up anything she feels like, walks with it 
for a bit and puts it down and then picks something else up. If I try to take it off her, I literally have to rip it out of her mouth or apply quite a lot of pressure to remove it. That's generally what it's like. When pups start picking stuff up, they don't just nicely let it go. Um, Dave goes on, goes on to say she's very stubborn and I give the long line a quick tug to get her to drop it. This team seems to turn into a play session with the long line. Uh, so on that on that picking stuff up thing is very uh, the bit here's the how do you handle it um, I can't I think I don't think print had a big thing with picking stuff up he definitely had a thing with eating grass and mucking around on the stops for a while and that's all in the blueprint and Dave even brings that up but picking stuff up, uh, pulling on the long line isn't going to be very effective. Um, the best thing is a quick step in and grab it out of your out of the pup's mouth. And I know you generally do have to use a surprising amount of pressure. It's nothing that's going to hurt or injure the pup. It's just you're just getting that object out of the mouth. And this is the key. You are trying to do it as quickly as possible with as little fuss as possible and as little engagement as possible and it's just step in, get it out, pretend it never happened and and move on. And that's it, nothing else. Dave goes on to say, I noticed in the blueprint you were very firm on print to not play with grass when he was on a sit, so I try to get her attention when she sits by removing the stick. It's too... You're very firm on print. When she... I try to get her attention. This is where it gets mixed up for me. But she normally puts her nose down and starts playing with anything in front of her and commando crawling towards me or something she sees. So it gets a bit mixed up here because you're saying, I noticed in the blueprint you were very firm on print to not play with grass when he was on a sit. And yes, I was, and that's all in the blueprint. So I try to get her attention when she sits by removing the stick. So it sounds like you tr- you tr- you're beginning a stop drill while the pup still got a stick in its mouth, that or something. You don't, and you don't want to do that. Definitely don't do that. And then you say, but she normally puts her nose down and starts playing with anything in front of her, and commando crawls towards me or something she sees. So now you're back. That's a stop drill. So the stick. And the stop drill are two different things. Don't do stop drills with the stick in the pup's mouth. Don't try to get the stick out of the pup's mouth by pulling on the long line. Do it by stepping in and removing it and then moving on. And then eating grass and the commando crawl is all in the blueprint on how I do the stop drills, including print eating grass and print getting up off the stop. It's all like it's it's not it's extremely ineffective to go into how that's done in a podcast. The demonstrational side of it that's in the blueprint is very important and you've got the blueprint, so I'm not going to go into it. But hopefully that makes sense the way I've broken that down. When, as soon as your pup sit, pick something up, take it out immediately and move on. Don't do stop drills. Don't start a stop drill with a stick in your pup's mouth if that's what you're doing. It's a little bit unclear and difficult to say. And follow the blueprint on your stop drills. Dave goes on to say, I sharply growl her when she starts moving and step into her space with my hand out 
in sick command but doesn't normally work. I've been putting her back in the place she commando called from but it seems to go downhill from there. Can be a conflict-filled stop drill with me having to raise my voice, growl and put her back numerous times. That can be what it's like. <clears throat> um, some of those early stop drills. But remember, early on, hopefully in those, usually, doing the non compliant stuff in part one usually gets you to the point where you're doing a five second stop drill or two or three second stop drill anyway without compliance if the puck gets up you just straight away give your go command to link the sound that you're using for your go command with the puck moving off and you say sit when the pup sits anyway or, or occasionally we gently push the pup into a sit position and give our sit command, give the pup a quick pat and then give our go command while we, pop, while we stand up and walk off which triggers the pup to stand up and walk off so we're linking the sound we use for our stop command with stopping and sitting and we're linking the sound we use for our go command with moving on and usually you've got half a two second stop by the start, by 13 weeks anyway. And then you start off by just trying to get one or two seconds of stop at 13 weeks. And if you do everything correctly and you've got the right, and, and you're approaching it the right way and you're looking at it the right way and you've, begun to develop the right bond and relationship with your pup or dog, the stop drill is generally not that difficult. Aside from what I show in the blueprint and what we've talked about in Q&As a lot before, aside from just the fact that it's a pup and it's not quite getting it yet, and yeah, they do get up heaps, like heaps, and the key is, is to just stay calm and just go up put them back and if they get up again you go up put them back and every now and again you do have to escalate and a few and and put them back three four five six times the key is that you keep it all balanced and in context of it's a 13 week old pup and it's first week of learning this freaking drill so you, it shouldn't feel like you're in unnecessary conflict. You're just repeating a process and letting a young pup gradually learn, which sometimes takes time. And in week one of that, it's really, you should not be in a spot where you're getting pissed off. You should have more, just for a lack of better word, compassion and empathy that it's a 13 week old pup and you can use pressure ah uh, no ah uh, and put it back you're only using that gruff tone and pushing the pup back to try and help it re realize what we want it's like ah uh, and then the second it stops good pup ah uh, good pup all that commander disapproval and the praise is for, and, and we'll get to this more in talking with Dave in this Q&A, that praise element and everything you say in these two big questions, it's all turns to, I'm growl, I have to keep stepping in and growling and pressure and yank on the long line and do all this, you only talk about praising your pup once and you do it at the wrong time. And you also talk about, you're talking about the pup still having the stick in its mouth, meaning you're not, it sounds like you don't want it to carry the stick, but sometimes you let it carry the stick. And that's a huge problem. 
it's really important reading and timing. You know, it's one of our principles, and we talk about it at length how important it is. If you don't want a pup to pick up random stuff, it's really important that the second it picks something up that is random, that you step in and pull, take it out of its mouth, like instantly. As soon as you let it carry it for 20 seconds sometimes, and then you decide you don't want it to carry it anymore, and then you try to take it out of its mouth, and then you wonder why it picks it up again, and then at some point, then you do a stop drill and you try to take it out. It's way too grey, man. It, it, you know, I've talked about how dogs have the the most intelligent dog. This is a full grown dog has the IQ of a three year old human, or about the same IQ as a pig. And 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 you're dealing with a thirteen week old version of that. extremely low IQ and extremely low capacity to learn and everything needs to be so clear cut and black and white it's ridiculous and you need a lot of patience and and the biggest key to to all of it is every time you go up putting pressure on you're putting that pressure on to try and cue the pup or dog to do the right thing and then as soon as they do the right thing you've got to praise them really freaking important to the and and the mindset behind a stop drill is uh all you're trying to teach the pup and show the pup in a stop drill is that when you give a stop command, the pup just has to sit down and then you pat it. That's what a stop drill is. Hey, can you please stop for a moment so I can pat you and tell you you're awesome? That's what a stop drill is. And and later on, I'm I'm coming on I'm coming in hot here on this early. There's way more stuff that we'll get to. And I'm and I'm and I'm I'm jumping ahead in my mind, talking about hooking into some of the stuff that Dave talks about later in these questions. That's the mindset, and you see, you talk about how print is print keeps it looks at you so hard out every time you do a stop drill, he turns around and looks at you. That's because a stop drill is hey print, you want to sit so I can pat you. And, Prince, and, and I've got the right bond and relationship with him. So when he hears me say sit, he's just like, hell yeah. And this is, once he gets it, which took some time, once he gets it, he's, his ass just drops and he turns around because I'm going to pat him and say, good boy. And then step side to side and walk around him and release him. You can't lose sight of that. A stop drill isn't, Hey, sit, otherwise you're in trouble if you don't. It can be that too. And it's a necessary part of it, particularly setting it up and training it and maintaining it. But the core of it, the foundation of it is, hey, stop so we can have a cool moment here. And, and reading through your all this stuff, which is like a good five or ten minute read, 1,500 to 2,000 words, it's like a small article. There's nothing in there that relates to that, and it's all about pressure and growling and pulling on the long line and he won't get it and I'm pulling my hair out and I'm frustrated. And you're talking about a 13 to 15, 15 year old a uh, 15 week old pup <clears throat> so he's saying he talks about the stick thing if I try to uh, I'm just trying to find where I was. If I try to take it off her, I literally have to rip it out of her mouth or apply a lot of pressure. We talked about that. 
Yeah, so he's saying, I sharply growl her when she starts moving and stepping into her space with my hand out and sick command, but doesn't normally work. I've been putting her back in the place she commando crawled from, but it seems to all go downhill from there. Can be a conflict-filled long-stop drill with me having to raise my voice, growl, and put her back numerous times. Sometimes if I hold her head and growl her sternly, she will listen and be focused for a second, but now that doesn't seem to be working as well as it used to. Stop drills seem to be going backwards. Should I be removing every little leaf and stick or blade from her mouth when we are walking and when we are walking or she is sitting? Yes, you should. Straight away. No blurred lines there. Um if you're blurring it, meaning sometimes you let her pick it up and carry it, and then other times you decide you don't want her to have it in her mouth, you're just pushing shit uphill. And every time you do something like that, you're just confusing the pup because sometimes she's allowed. What you're doing there is you're just becoming the guy that every now and again for no reason that she can recognise, you just step in and grab her face and pull something out of her mouth when she thinks she's allowed to because it's because sometimes you let her carry it. So that alone can break down the relationship and and attentiveness and all of that sort of thing and it's the praise and having that moment in the stop drill of sit good girl good girl and then when you step back and she pauses for like one second and you can step in and go good girl good girl that's in like their chest starts puffing up and they're starting to get eye contact and then you step back, you get a second of pause and you release and they pop off with their tail wagon like, oh, that was cool. And then you do another stop. Then you say sit again a minute later and, fi- and a young little pup, finally the gears grind over and they're like, oh, this is that time when I sit and he pats me and then he steps in and out and gives me another pat and then waits again and releases. And all That's when you start getting that ass drop, turn around, eye contact, get the pat, wait longer so I can get another pat and then I wait longer again and I get the release. <laughs> you know? Super freaking important, man. And nothing that you've said in any of this uh, makes me think that you realise that. He's saying, I feel like it creates unnecessary conflict to stop her every time and try to get her to release it and that she will grow out of this fairly quickly, question mark, avoiding unnecessarily conflict that I cannot always... Nah, I I think it's wrong because there's some... And and here's where dog training gets so freaking nuanced. You have to be 100% consistent and often trying to quote-unquote avoid conflict is just setting yourself up for way more conflict and issues later on. However, being super consistent and, and persistent, and sometimes it is. Sometimes you're in a phase with a pup where it gets up off a stop like eight times or it's eating grass during stop drills all week and you're doing 50 a week. But if you just stay calm and level and consistent and just every time, no, up, up, put them back, put them back, put them back, eventually they get it. Where it all turns to shit is if you get pissed off and escalate more and forget about the praise. Dave goes on, goes on to say she also has a bad habit of wanting to play and interact with me by grabbing the long line when we are walking, running in front of me with it in her mouth, looking at me to say or do something, jumping around, looking at me for a reaction. Sometimes when I ignore this for a minute, she will drop it and carry on. Big mistake there. 
We've already talked about that, but we'll get to this again. But normally she will carry on jumping around, going behind me and growling and giving a little bark, touching my leg with her mouth. When I growl her for barking at me and doing this, she quickly darts away, normally behind me or off to the side. So I sternly growl her again. This seems to be escalating the situation. Any thoughts here? This is where you're killing me, man. <laughs> And all these questions and everything, because that exact thing, excuse me, um, that exact thing, biting at the long line, is in the blueprint, demonstrated, and I go over it and, and, and the principles and everything, and I talk about how important it is that timing and straight away, man, and, and it's like a non-issue. Print started doing it, and I, and I fixed it exactly how I show in the blueprint in part two real quickly, and it was never an issue again. That's how you avoid unnecessary conflict, as you nip things in the bud. If you, like you're saying, you're talking about sometimes when I ignore this for a minute, she'll drop it, but normally she'll carry on jumping around, going behind me, growling, giving a little bark, touching my... This, she shouldn't even have time for any of that because the second she picks it up, you correct her for it and keep walking. So it doesn't even make sense. And all of that sort of stuff... Pups, are, uh, uh, they don't have an IQ and their thinking is very, very simple, but they, they have, they're they pretty good at picking up on certain things. And, and a big part of uh, the way a pup or dog operates is all about hierarchies because they're a pack animal. And it's all about testing and working out where they should be and where everyone else is. And as simple as they are, and as clear as you have to make training, any type of inconsistencies like that, any type of them getting away with being able to test you, but then every now and again you do react and it's a bit off and on and all over the place, really sketchy ground, man. Everything has to be black and white, clear cut, and balanced. There has to be really clear rules and boundaries. And you can't let them do something sometimes for a little while and then growl at them for doing it. And you, you're just going, that's unnecessary conflict. It's dragging everything out. You're going round and round in circles. You're screwing up the relationship and the way your dog looks at you and everything. It's really, really bad. And and I don't that's what where you're killing me, man, because that's all in part two of the blueprint. And that's why we're all here. So I don't it's it's frustrating for me to have to explain that. And there's no nice way of doing it. Any thoughts here? I had to put a lot of pressure on her. Picking up the long line at the start three weeks ago, I had to harshly and quickly tug it and growl her for quite a while for her to let it go at the start. She still carries on picking it up, but now I only have to give it a quick pull or stand on it and growl her off. Normally I have to repeat this a few times as she is quite persistent. This also seems to escalate into growling and barking and jumping around and wanting to play with me. Sorry if this is understand. I hope you get the general idea though. Today was a bad day. Pulling my hair out. She does seem quite headstrong and knows how to push my buttons. I guess I just need to be firm and consistent. You need to be firm and consistent and build a bond with your dog, man. I'd say put it the other way around. You need to be consistent, build a bond with your dog, and be firm. And you'll, if you're in, at all inconsistent, it doesn't matter how firm you are, you won't get there. And if you're 
if you're at all con- inconsistent, you'll constantly be in con- conflict because your pup won't be learning. The more consistent you are, the less conflict you have. And the faster you can get to the point where you're giving your dog praise and training, and then that's when you start to get that attentiveness and compliance and eye contact and all that good stuff, all the stuff you're asking, like, well, how does why does Print look at you in a stop drill? It's because he's looking for that praise. However, it's nuanced because you do need that pressure too. But you've got to be freaking important, uh, freaking careful. It's really important that you are coming at it the right way, man. Here's my notes. I've basically done a ton, a lot more off the cuff than what are in my notes. Here's my notes off the back of all of that. Make sure you're bonding with your dog. The praise on what you do want is just as important as pressure. Anytime you use pressure, you need to flip it to praise as fast as possible. Anytime you tell your dog not to do something, you have to show it what you want it to do instead of that negative behavior. And you need your dog to look up at you and want to work with you and please you. You need that bond and rapport. The reason Print is so fixated on me is because he's constantly watching me, waiting for him, waiting for me to tell him to do something so he can do it and get praise. He loves working for me and with me. You have to get to the point where your dog is looking to you in a more positive light than a negative one. You can't let a 13-month-old pup push your buttons and get frustrated. That's a biggie, man. And they know. <laughs> they know, man. As basic and as simple as they are, a 13-month-old pup knows when you're getting pissed off like before you do. And they disrespect the hell out of that. At the same time, they love doing it. It's important for them. If they are around someone or something that can get pissed off, they want to know about it. So they're constantly testing for it and making sure and finding out whether it's there or not. I could go on about that too, but the for ages, but I'm not going to. The important thing is to know is you can't let a 13-month-old pup push your buttons and piss you off. You're just dead in the water, man. You're, on, you're actually on fire in the water. <laughs> like you're screwed, completely screwed. You can't let training sessions turn into pure conflict. You have to do whatever it takes to smooth them out. Dude, you, at, at the time you wrote this question, you are you were in week one of compliance training. You'd be way better off going back to part one, ditching all the compliance training and just trying to get like a two-second stop when you, where you sort of can pat your pup and just walk around. You know, like the stick thing, man. If you're in this position point where you're like pulling your hair out, getting really pissed off, I would drive as far as it takes to get to a clean mowing sports ground with no sticks or leaves or nothing, just clean mowing grass. You know, um, remember you can't, ho- this is back to my notes, you can't hold a grudge or get pissed off. You can you can use pressure, but you have to switch back to praise straight away. Like good use of pressure and dog training looks very weird would look extremely strange if you did it in real life in front of a person like like you know if you (laughs) if you took someone 
using praise perfectly in a stop drill and getting the result and then and you like superimpose that and ma- into a video and it ma- made it look like the person was doing that to a person not a puppy in a stop drill it would look bonkers because you're going I'm going print sit ah good boy and the, and, and I'm going ah and stepping in maybe pushing him back and if he goes to get up again, I go, ah, again. And then the second that he sits down again, I'm going, good boy, good boy. So it's it's very off and on and backwards and forwards, and it has to be, man. And if your pup gets up off a stop drill and you put it back, and then and then you and then you carry that up frustration for any more than that. 0.7 of a second that it takes for the pup to realise and, and and sit back down, you're, you're screwed too. It has to be up and then it, it, that whole idea is gone out of your head. You know, and, and you have to be doing that, that up of pressure, and you're really doing that to try and just nudge that pup back into the spot where all that instantly drops from you and now you and all your body language just drops and relaxes and you can say good pup and you and you're doing a relaxed step to the side and a step back in good pup good boy and then you step back back in whatever you know and you carry on with the stop drill as per the blueprint extremely important man and remember, we're only ever using the minimum amount of pressure or praise required to get the job done. I've spoken about this before. The whole reading and timing of the application and releasing of pressure and praise, the reading, timing and measure of the application and releasing of pressure and praise is that's... Uh, you know, the people that are extremely good dog trained, that people call him whisperers. He's the dog whisperer or a horse whisperer. Someone, and it looks like it to the untrained eye because someone's had this dog that is a complete pain in the ass or a horse. And then someone spends two minutes with it and all of a sudden it's just like sitting there, chill, looking up, like dog grin, panting, listening to everything they say. That's cause, because they are just master at the reading and timing and measure of the application and releasing of pressure and praise. Every little micro movement that the dog does, their timing or body language or pressure on the long line, the way they check and then drop the pressure off as soon as the dog relaxes and it just make the dog realizes straight away what you want them to do. And 99 times out of a hundred, when someone's like, God, oh, it's just the, the stop drills just turn, falling apart. I can't get it. It's deteriorating. It's getting worse because you're off on one of those things. And the dog's actually try, constantly trying to react to you, but everything, something you're doing is opposite and you don't realise it. So it's like you're saying, you think you're saying, uh, this is just a complete example, but you think you're telling the dog to walk forward, but you're actually telling it to walk left with your body language and you're... you're getting pissed off at it for walking left. You know what I mean? It's probably a really shitty analogy, but you're not conveying to the dog what you think you are conveying, and you're just confusing it, and you're getting pissed off because it's not understanding, but the dog has no freaking idea what you're telling it to do, or it thinks it does. Well, it does, but you don't understand the language of it. And something's off there with your reading and timing and pressure and praise and the way it's off and on or your consistency or something. 
uh, it's 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 all about communicating with the dog in a way that it can understand. And it's really freaking easy to, it's always, uh, the dog always thinks it's understanding you in some way and it's trying to do it, but you get the point. It's a really weird, complicated thing to explain, but you know what I mean. You're confusing it. You're not saying what you think you're saying. And the dog doesn't understand. You're getting pissed off, but the dog's trying its best. So, to continue with my notes, you can't hold a grudge or get pissed off with a dog. You can use pressure, but you have to switch back to prey straight away. I'm saying here, that whole thing of your pup grabbing the long line and bouncing around and looking back and waiting for you to react, that's something you have created by either being too reactive and feeding into it too much or not being consistent enough. You said you were being hard on the picking up sticks thing, but then you started leaving it in in the hope that she would grow out of it. You can't do that. You also said she picks up the long line and goes behind you and jumps and barks. She shouldn't even have the chance to do that. How can she be going behind you and around and jumping and barking if you're correct, correcting it the second she picks it up? It doesn't make sense. I wouldn't let long line grabbing and grass eating and picking up sticks slide in training, but you have to spend positive time with the pup and get things moving forward. I've already explained this, but I said even if you have to, oh, sorry, you have to spend positive time with the pup and get things moving forward. Even and my next note is even if you have to do that outside of training, like if you're at a point where everything's just turning to shit, like you're saying, you're pulling your hair out and you don't even know what to do, the pup won't even look at you in a stop drill. It's a serious problem, man, and and. If every, like I said, if everything's right, the pup's basically doing perfect stop drills at the end of part one when it's like halfway through part one when it's like freaking 10 weeks old. People do it all the time. Put it in the inner circles. Send it to me in a message. I've had pups doing it heaps. Nine, ten weeks old. It's not solid. It's, you know, don't take that out of context. But And they're sitting there and you, you, you give your stop sound and they know that, that this is time for a, pattern I've had blimmin eight week old heading dog pups dropping on their belly to a hiss <laughs> uh, I have and it's, it's so they can get a pat you know um, yeah next note is even if you take a step back I've already spoken about that if if trying to do this stuff with a 13-week-old pup is getting you to a point where you're pulling your hair out and training, uh, a training session is this massive conflict-filled nightmare, then forget about training, man, and go back to part one because it's a freaking disaster. Next note is 13 weeks old is super young. I've already carried, covered that. You're... More notes, you're one week into the very beginnings of really basic compliance training. You really shouldn't be at the point you're at, this frustrated and pulling your hair out. You need to chill way out. This is a biggie, man. You need to watch your head in the blueprint. Watch the whole thing and you need to listen to all the Q&As. And you need to watch the whole thing properly and actually do the stuff that's in it and you need to listen to the Q&As, and you need to listen to them properly. Like you need it, this is my note, you need it badly, you're way off track. And you need to watch the blueprint very carefully and actually do what it says. Like I said, man, there's no way in making that like a fun, uplifting chat. 
but in circumstances like these, I think it's even more important that I'm a hundred percent honest, like really important. Um, <clears throat> so that's that. Moving on. More from Dave shortly. Aaron, am I pushing shit up hill training in Irish Terrier? I love challenge, but have you had any success stories with this breed or similar? Um, definitely not pushing shit up hill. Um, have you had success stories with this breed or similar? And yes, we have. Lots. Um, I'm not sure 100% with Iris Terriers, but we've had Foxies and Jack Russells and Pit Bulls and frickin' all sorts. Um, so real simple, you know, and we, we say this all the time and and, and there's, there's a big, big part of part one of the blueprint is all about choosing a dog. Um, you know, it's good if you can go for one of the more highly suited breeds. Um, however, basically any dog um, can be trained to the point where it is not a hindrance on a hunt. And, and because of the nature of what a dog is, if you get it to the point where it's not a hindrance, it's also a massive help. You know, and, and an iris terrier is way within the realms of, of something that that a hundred percent you could argue all day long that there's way better suited things than an iris terrier. However, an iris terrier is way within the realms of something that could be very, very good. And it's definitely way within the realm of something that could be a well-trained Irish Terrier will definitely hands down be way better than an untrained name your ideal deer dog breed. Vizsla, GSP, Heading Dog, Labrador, what, whatever you want. So no, you're not pushing shit uphill. Tom, this is a, a slightly, uh, we'll just do it. <laughs> um, Hi Paul, I'm having a really big issue with the stop drill at the moment. I have a six month old GSP that was doing good a few weeks ago. I would have been able to do an extended stop to 40 metres or so, no problem. But then it was like a switch flicked and she decided she doesn't want to do it now. Now if I give her the command sometimes, she still sits quick and sometimes it's delayed, but every time now, once I step into pad her and step back, she instantly jumps up at me, and when I pull her off with the long line, she starts to bite at it. I just Something just occurred to me here. One thing, I'm wondering why you're pulling her off with the long line. It is a thing. Where every now and again, for whatever reason, you're training a stop drill and a pup or a dog gets super freaking sticky on the stop, and you pull her off, pull them off it with the long line, like light pull with the long line to get them moving. Freaking rare that you have to do it, man. You can usually do it with body language and stepping off and positive reinforcement. Come on, let's go. Um, the go command is not hard. As important as it is, it's generally not that hard. But you're talking about a stop drill that was awesome, instantly turning to shit, and she just every time I step away, she gets up. Have you done something weird with pulling her off the stop on the long line, and now she's you've still got the long line in your hand, and you're somehow lightly pulling on the long line, which is causing her to get up? Or have you done something wrong there, which is screwed up? your stop drill. You've got to be freaking careful with that, man. Holding the long line, and and uh, that's a real common one. I see it relatively often in one-on-ones where someone's saying, man, my stop drill's no good, and they're shortening up the long line, 
in their hand, like coiling it up and doing all this shit that I say not to do and that I definitely don't do in the blueprint and they put their dog on a sit and then they're like marching around in circles holding this short long line and the do- and then the next thing they're checking the dog on the long line so the dog's all keyed up waiting to get yanked off the stop with the long line so it's, it's jumping up at wrong times and the person hasn't realised that that's why the dog's doing it and they're like, ah, sit back down and then they go to take a step and the dog jumps up and they're like, nah, sit. And But the, they don't realise the dog's jumping up because they're yanking it with the long line and stuff like that. I've seen it. Just complete nightmare. So make sure you're not doing that. I have been dealing with it by command of disapproval and stand short on the line so she can't jump. However, after a bit she goes to sit again. I then try relax my body language and switch to praise i can usually get a few seconds to then move on but it doesn't seem to be improving i'm not sure if i'm dealing shortening up and standing on the long line to try and get the dog to stay still sound stay still sounds super weird to me shouldn't have to be doing it and i wouldn't do it and i don't do it and i haven't showed people how to do that um I can usually get a few seconds to then move on, but it doesn't... Uh, did I just read that? I have been really trying to focus on the timing of the command of disapproval when she goes to jump, but that's not phasing her. Would love to hear how, hear how you would deal with it from here and what you think could be the cause, as it just seems like one day she was great and the next she's forgotten everything pretty disheartened at the moment because it feels like we have lost everything we have worked for man (laughs) yeah but (sighs) i've seen it a couple of times actually recently in the inner circle where people are just like uh someone was like asking the question before it even happened what do I do when my dog gets aggressive and biting and wanting to attack stuff and it's like hasn't happened yet but just wondering what I do and it's like when's you what (laughs) why are we even talking about this man like going in all preloaded and then someone was like oh yeah no could be a serious issue and make sure you do this so I'd hold on a short leash and it's like no stop You've got to freaking focus on what you're trying to do and be positive about it and head out to train a good dog. Don't head out to... When you're going training, you're going training to train a good dog. You've got a nice dog that you are going to train into a good dog. You're not going out with a difficult dog that you're trying to avoid being shit. Does that make sense? You've got a good dog that's going to be amazing. You haven't got a difficult dog that you're trying to make not shit. It's two very different things. I used to ride freestyle motocross. I used to backflip dirt bikes and and like Nitro Circus, I was never that good, but I could backflip a dirt bike 23 metres. And I did it around some of the best riders in the world. And I watched a lot of people come and go trying backflips, trying to backflip motorbikes. This is one of the biggest keys. You practice into foam pits over and over, right? And lots of people would land the right side up into the foam pit all weekend and then their first one to dirt land perfectly upside down. And the reason was, is when they were jumping into foam, they were trying to land the right way up. And then when they go to dirt, they're trying not to land upside down. It's too. It's very difficult when you're doing your first flip to dirt to focus on just do it normally and just flip the bike and land wheel side down. It's very difficult to have crashing 
not in your mind at all. But that's the key. That's the key. You have to be focusing on landing wheel side down. As soon as crashing's in your head, even if it's if it's if you're how are you supposed to flip a dirt bike properly if all you're thinking about is not crashing? Don't crash, don't crash, don't crash. <laughs> it doesn't work. What you have to be thinking about is the perfect pull and body position and landing correctly and your roll in speed. You have to be focusing on doing the perfect flip. Everything's the same, but it's very important in dog training that you are focusing on training a good dog, not focusing on how to avoid all the disasters. The way to avoid all the disasters and everything turned to shit is focusing on training a good dog. I've seen it a lot in the, in the circle lately. It's really freaking important. Uh, I, like, and I do a lot of mental stuff like that with my hunting and fishing and dog training and everything, and especially my dogs, man. It is so important that deep down in my head, I've got a good dog and it's going to be good. There's no two, it's not, it's not a debate, you know, um, and, and that's where everyone should, that's where you have to be, you can't be going out trying to avoid the disaster, you have to be moving towards what you want, really important. <clears throat> Okay, pretty disheartened at the moment because it feels like we've lost everything we've worked for. My notes on this. Don't look for the bad behaviour, look for the good behaviour. Don't focus and feed into and look for the bad stuff. Focus and feed into and look for the good stuff. You really need to get into that place in those drills where you're stepping in and out and patting your dog and the dog has to like it. You need to be able to step in and pat the dog for a good 10 seconds or so or even longer. Do the short ones like a couple of seconds right at the start with a young pup to get it started, but later on you have to get to the point where your pup or dog is sitting happily waiting for a pat. Both of these questions in this Q&A is, are both big long question talking about all the bad stuff and how much pressure and conflict you're getting into with your pup. Both of your guys' main focus needs to be on getting to the point where you can sit or kneel or stand calmly and pat your young dog. My next note is talk about how a lot of people's dogs can't do that in a one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of people in a one-on-one -on -one session, and they'll ring me or email me or something, and and um, <clears throat> like, man, my stop drill's rough. I can't get it. And they turn up with their dog, and we walk and talk for a bit. I'm getting the feel for everything, and 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 eventually, when the time's right, I, I one of the first thing I always do is um, show me your stop drill. And because a stop isn't just a stop, man, it's in, it's so far from that. It's like anything but that. And like the the I've talked about this in Q and A's before. The stop drill and the way that we do it in the blueprint. That's like our the stop drill is like our hub for for everything else, you know. Um, that's where we get our stop and our control and our attentiveness. That's where we pat and bond with the dog. Um, later on, that's the stop drill is what we can use. If our dog's getting scared of something, it's trying to run away, we can put it on a stop. And all of that work and that bond that we get with the pup 
through praise in the stop is that's it, it, once you get all that set up and the pup knows it's a positive thing and they're looking up to you, you can just go anywhere with that. Like I got a message today from Hass of his dog sitting in a running helicopter. It might be the first time she's been in it. I think it, I think it is. I might be wrong about that. She may have been in a helicopter before, but long story short, there was a helicopter idling on the ground with no one in it. It had no back doors on it. And here's Hass's dog just sitting on the back seat just chill like she's sitting on her dog bed at home, you know, with the running helicopter. Um, and I said, um, replied to that to, to Hass and said, um, you know, once you've got all of that bond stuff set up right, that, that and it's all in the stop drill, your dog will just follow you through hell and back or anywhere like the, the, they look up to you so much and rely and depend on you so much and respect your opinion so much that it could be the craziest situation and I could just go, here, Print, and say, Print, sit. If he gets a bit sketchy and wants to run away, I'd say, Print, sit, and he'll sit. And if I say print sit, that means it's okay here. And and it's crazy. Um, and I, I said to Hass, like, you know, once you've got that set up, it's crazy what you can do with a dog. And he said, yep, uh, they just basically walked up to it, put her in, come back. The helicopter took off the, in full rotor wash. But because Hass is standing there, and Mitt's a well-trained dog with a good bond with Hass, she's just like, well, the boss is standing here, so it's all good. And she's just like, I've seen them, crazy uh, situations with dogs their first time around helicopters, and they're just sitting there like panting, looking up at you, and you can, you're, you, it's so loud, it's ridiculous. You've got earmuffs on, the dog's got nothing, but what I'm trying to say is that bond, that that relationship and getting that right, like everything feeds off that, man. And once you've got that, that's when you get to the point where you've got a dog you don't even need to say anything to because they're like, you know, even recently, I think it was one of the last year I shot over print, I shot a seeker in the Kaimanawas and we haven't been doing that much hunting lately, you know, the last year or so. And we haven't been hunting in ages and, there was heaps of sign around and print was keen and, and I looked to my left and here's the seeker hind just cruising through like 15, 20 metres away. And I shot her. The shot, it was a good killing shot, but the shot angle was a bit different and it was a bit off and she took off like mad, just flat stick. And there were, there were at least five or six other deer there and, and they didn't know where we were because we were sneaking through. It was nice and quiet. And so this mob of deer is walking through the bush and they just hear a bang. They don't even know where we are. So they ran across in front of us like 10 metres away. Um, Prince sort of slightly in front of me and off to my right. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm just 100% focused on this deer that I've hit because when I shot it, it took off like crazy. And all of a sudden there's just deer freaking running everywhere, which isn't an ideal situation. I'm thinking, man, how far is this freaking thing going to go? Was my shot on point? Um, where's the one I've hit going to, is going to, where's it going to go? Is it getting mixed up with the other deer? Um, and it's all, it's right on dark. So I'm thinking, I'm almost like Jesus, you know, um, I've been in some difficult situations like that before where I've hit a deer. It's with a lot of other deer. The dog doesn't know which one to track. And that's, one of them can be one of the most difficult situations. Turned out it was fine. All the deer run off on a different angle. My deer had only gone 50 metres and print hooked straight on the one I hit and took me straight to it. 
But what the, what I'm about what I was saying is all that chaos we're cruising through. Prints in front of me tracking these deer, indicating it was a it was an indirect indication. Print was telling me there's something right here, but we didn't have the wind right. We didn't have that direct wind, and I saw the deer before Print got the direct wind. So I shot it before Print even knew anything. So pr- Prince to Print, he's just walking. Boom! There's a shot, and there's freaking deer running everywhere. I'm paying no attention to Print. All I'm doing is trying to keep an eye on this deer. And after all the deer friend is running off, I open the bolt and next thing my brain goes, oh shit, what's Print doing? Because he was out to my right and all those deer run off to my right and I look down and he's just standing there looking at me, (laughs) waiting for me to put him in front and start tracking. And that is that bond and the dog looking up to you and always looking to you. What are we doing next? And that's all in the stop drill. All that in and out, round and round. Um, that's where it's from. The whole thing that we do in the stop with the stop drill and the blueprint. Um, the amount of time someone turns up. For a one-on-one, my stop drill's no good, can't do it. It's a dog's not listening, rebellious dog, oh, it's too smart and all this sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> I say, show me your stop drill. And they've sort of got, like, they say stop, they say sit, and the dog sort of slows down, turns around, walks around a couple of circles, half sits down and gets up again. And the handler basically just stands there and watches the dog do that and then looks up at me and says, uh, see, dog's useless, <laughs> pretty much. Um, and as we start to work with it, and I'm showing them reading and timing and all of this stuff, a huge thing that comes out of it is, um, and then when we get to the point where we've got the dog waiting for a moment, and I say, okay, now you've got to give the dog a, some praise. It's sort of this quick half step in, awkward, like good dog, and then carry on. It's got to be like heartfelt, you know, and, and, and it's, it's got to be real. And you're stepping in and saying, good dog, good pet, and you've got to get the dog looking up to you and acknowledgement, and you're building a bond. It, it's a and like you can tell they haven't really done it before they don't do it properly they haven't got that set up with their dog or when they try to pat the dog it's sort of reaching up and biting their sleeve or um, it gets up every time they try to pat it or um, you can tell the, the handler is awkward and the dog's awkward while they're trying to pat their dog when that's the most important thing, you know, you, you've got to be able to, you, you've got to get to a point where your dog is super relaxed, everything's relaxed, his body language is relaxed, and you can pat the freaking thing. And it, that might sound strange or silly or obvious, or of, well, of course, what do you mean, I can pat my dog, of course you've got to pat your dog. Can you be out in the middle of the field and say sit when there's a couple of distractions around and your dog actually sits and when you step in, does it look up and receive praise nicely while being engaged with you? It's really freaking important. Um, and my next note is talk about what my dogs are like. Well, the print story is, you know, with that seeker is one, but... You know, this is another one I should. I really need to make a video about to just to show you. But if I mean, Dave said it in the blue. When you say sit in the blueprint, print sits down and turns around and looks at you. That's it. And if I, you know, every morning I get up and and first thing I do when I wake up is sit down and and me and my dog have a little 
you know, a couple of minutes and I print comes over and sits down and then Miko tries to come in and barge in the way and but I'm basically just sitting down, eye contact, patting them. And it's their favourite freaking thing. Miko, uh, Miko's got it full on. Where if I call her, she just comes flying in, plants your ass, and the eye contact is extreme. Uh, it looks like I've treat trained the hell out of her or something. Um, I talked about that before, is that often that pe- people were going for that super ass planted eyes looking up what treat training gets you uh i believe sometimes that's trying to mimic what you get when you do it properly and but the two things are completely different um that's that next question this is the next one from dave <laughs> So I mean guys this is a biggie she's a biggie oh this is the heaviest Q&A that that I can remember doing and I've said here Dave you're gonna have to bear with me on this one man this is another big one so Dave is sitting here I've got this is another big long one not quite as long as the other but it's got three or four different points here um, I've actually got notes after every point I've sort of broken it down so I'll just read through it we'll see how we go I'll probably interject again hey Paul just a quick update on Blue she is doing a lot better than when I wrote you earlier thanks for the advice Paul and Inner Circle so me and members in the Inner Circle commented straight away like some of these comments are a couple of weeks old um, some of these questions like Dave asked me that first question a good two or three weeks ago so quite often when I see something in the inner circle I'll comment straight away and then we do the Q&A's later so Dave's saying thanks for the advice that's good and he continues to say she's coming along really well with the sit and stays likes to put her head down and eat grass on the sit and sometimes crawling but not as bad now. I'm trying to lift her head up if she chews grass and growl to get her attention. Sometimes this works. Is this good? Might be depending on what you're doing, but lift her head up and growl. I don't know. Um, I doubt it. Um, I would be much more inclined to just either up and a step in or just a step in and touch, you know, a step in and touch. Um, yeah, like basically like I show in the blueprint when Prince doing it, you know. Should I be really consistent with this or will it pass with time and maturity? We've already spoken about that, but yes, you should 1 billion percent be consistent with it. That's like the key to dog training. And will it pass with time and maturity? Probably not if you're not consistent. She's getting better at looking at me before I release her though. Well, that's good. I noticed when you put print on a sit but stand on the long line, he normally turned around and looked at you, which is good. My pup doesn't turn around and look at me. She knows she has to sit for a while, so she quickly tries to find something in front of her mouth to chew or play with while she's sitting very cunning in brackets <laughs> uh, a couple of thoughts come to mind I've got some notes on this which I'll get into in a moment but one thought that came into mind while I was reading that is if chewing a blade of grass is of higher interest to your pup than you are that's where you know you've got a problem and the reason why Prince stops and turns around to look at me is because he finds me more important and appealing than the blade of grass in front of him. And that's just being honest. And you're saying, 
My pup doesn't turn around and look at me. She knows she has to sit for a while, so she quickly tries to find something in front of her mouth to chew or play with while she's sitting. Very cunning. My notes are, she's not cunning. She's a 14-week-old pup. It is just doing what you are setting it up to do. Print turns around and looks at me because I made the stop drill a positive thing. He's turning around waiting for me to pat him. That's the whole idea of the stop drill. There's two ways of framing it. If you look at it like your dog has to stop when you tell it to and it's in trouble when it doesn't listen, then it's a negative thing. The stop drill is a negative thing when you do it that way. It has to be the stop drill is an opportunity for your pup to stop so you can pat it. It's pat time and cuddle time. It's a positive thing. You put boundaries in place. But that's why my dogs do it so well, because they want to do it. It really does seem like you're coming at it from the wrong angle. Dave continues to say, maybe when I put her on a stop, instead of standing on the long line, I should pull it a little bit to get her head focused on me. Would that work? And I said, no, that's a terrible idea. I'm not going to go into that one, but don't do it. Don't pull on the long line. Don't do stuff that's different to what's in the blueprint. Really freaking important. When we are walking and she gets too far in front, I have taken to making a noise a split second before I stand on the long line. My note on that, that's a terrible idea too. Don't do that. You need to watch your head in the blueprint. All of that is covered later on in non-communicative training. It's really important that you don't do that. You have to do what I do and don't try all these different things or it's not going to work. It's really That's really freaking important, man, that you don't make a sound before you stand on the long line. The fact that you don't make a sound before you stand on the long line it's, again, this is all covered in the blueprint, like massive big talks on it, describing it, demonstrating it. But there's two, two of the major types of training in the blueprint. There's more than these two, there's loads. One is communicative training, so you make a sound and you link that with an action. Non-communicative training is when you do something like stand on the long line without saying anything. This is in the blueprint in deep, deep detail. Standing on the long line without saying anything makes it the dog's responsibility to monitor its distance from you. It's, so non-communicated training is really, really important. And when we're doing, and there's so many different stages and phases in the blueprint, right? If we're at the stage, at A stage, where we're standing on the long line without saying anything, it's really freaking important that we're standing on it without saying anything because we're teaching the pup or dog that it's range, It's making the it the dog's responsibility to stay to monitor its range on its own. Um, so adding in making a sound a split second before I stand on the long line, like that's that's one way of teaching the stop command. That's how we teach stop to the shot. That depending on where you're at and what you're doing, it's potentially a terrible idea. says this seems to work to slow her down and she knows the long line will be stood on soon well she will for sure do you see anything wrong with doing this and I'll just explain that I had another note here the whole idea of not saying anything is so it's the dog's responsibility to watch you to watch you and stay close if you make a noise before you stand on the long line it stuffs the whole thing up also it's all a process and your dog's 14 weeks old man 
I keep forgetting that your dog's 14 weeks old at this point. This, Honestly, man, this is just completely bananas. You're on part two of a 12-part series. If you haven't already, it's very important that you watch ahead so you understand what and how and why you're doing what you're doing now and what you're going to be doing moving forward. It makes everything much easier. It's hugely important for some people, and I think it's really important for you. Day says, one more thing, please. <clears throat> when she feels like being playful, she will dance around and growl to get my attention. If I growl her, then she jumps back away from me and barks. If I go to get the long line to check her, she runs further away and I end up having to try and catch the long line. That whole thing there, a pup or a dog jumping around to get your attention, you'll and then she runs faster so you're trying to catch up to get the long line, man, with a 14-week-old pup is just total freaking disaster, eh? You, sh you can't put yourself in that situation he goes on to say I think she thinks that this is play so I have started <laughs> so I started bending down and calling her to me after she barks or growls when she comes I pat her for coming grab the long line and double peep whistle to walk in front she normally walks in front then knows when I have the long line she doesn't get to be silly anymore Am I doing the right thing? This is my note. No, you're not, because what you're doing is putting praise on what you don't want. What you're saying is, is when your dog jumps and growls, you call your dog to you and pat it. So what you're saying there is, when my dog feels playful, she jumps around and growls to get my attention. If I growl her, she jumps back away and barks. If I go to get the long line, she runs further away. When she does this, I call her to me and pat her. My dog jumps around, growls, barks, and I pat her. That's what you're saying if you shorten that up a bit. My dog jumps around, growls, barks, and I pat her. I had we had this on a on a Palmico one. And this is how squirrely like bad dog training advice can get and bad treat training and um especially uh pe people that are um going for positive only, the old, the old ignore the bad stuff and only just praise the positive stuff. And someone said, "Hey, I'm pretty sure it might have even, I definitely didn't tell them how to do that and they either come up, either someone else told them to do it or they come up with it on their own that sorry, I heard, thought I heard something there um, thought I heard someone knock on the door but I don't think so um They were trying to train their dog to not jump on the couch. So when their dog jumped on the couch, they got treats and held the treats down off the couch so the dog would jump down off the couch and eat the treat. So that was teaching the dog not to go on the couch. <laughs> you don't have to be a scientist to, to, to realise the problem with that because how does the dog? what's one way that the dog could get a treat? is it could jump on the couch, then the master gets the treat, then it jumps off the couch and eats the treat. If it wants another treat, it jumps back on the couch, you get the treat, it jumps off the couch. <laughs> you see what I'm saying here? You're saying, I'm not saying this is exactly what ha is happening here, but <sighs> this is what I'm saying, you're killing me, man. <laughs> um... And again, no, don't do that because what you're doing is you're putting praise on what you don't want. Potentially, 
What you're saying is your dog jumps around, barks, growls, does something you don't want it to do, so you call it to you and pet it. And I'm saying don't do it. Don't do that, please. Dave then goes on to say, the blueprint is wonderful, a great resource for training owners to train dogs. Thank you for all your kind words. Kind regards, Dave. Thank you so much, Dave. And thank you so much for signing up to the blueprint. I know with I know what everything I've gone over has today has been a lot. I really hope you take it the right way. I hope everyone listening takes it the right way. I'm not the only reason I'm doing it is because or I, I say it this way or it comes if it if it it is with a hundred percent good intent, you know. Um I've had I've definitely had it in my career training people to train dogs where someone's come to me and said, Hey, I'm doing this or look what my dog's doing or we've done this and this is happening and I've said exactly what I think is the best way to fix it or stop that happening and people have got really pissed off with me for doing that. So because it doesn't agree with them or they take it the wrong way or they think I'm having a go or whatever. That's why I put the big warning on the start of these things and off the back of them and try to sandwich it a little bit because, again, if some of these talks come across with zero context and just, I'm trying this and I'm saying no, <laughs> and this one was a biggie, man. But... um. Honestly, Dave, thanks, man, and and that's just me being a hundred percent honest with you. That's exactly if my best friend come to me and ask me all that stuff, I'd be way harsher. <laughs> um, yeah, and again, thanks for signing up to the blueprint, man, and and I'm just here to do everything I can to help you guys. Eh. Um. Rebecca, hi Paul and Big Game Indicating Dogs in a circle. We have a 13-week-old Vizsla pup who has been doing very well in training. He is very confident, walks out in front easily. His stops are reasonable, though he doesn't sit until we are with about a metre of him. I have two main questions, though. First is, given he is so confident, he will often run ahead and get towards the end of the long line. We stand on the long line and he thinks it's a stop and sits down until we release. This can happen over and over as he just wants to run all the, all the time. I don't want to overdo stops, and without the command and controlled release, I'm worried it will take away from his stops. Any suggestion? Um, yeah, I would say don't worry about it super early days, and it'll smooth out. You quite often get funny little annoying, potentially annoying situations, um, particularly early on with young pups where they, they're taking something the wrong way and exactly like that. They take off because they're stoked to be out for a walk and you have to stand on the long line, but when you do, they sit down, so now, ah, is the pup in a stop or what's going on? So you have to give the go command and then they take off and you have to stand on again. So you find yourself um, stand on the long line, stand on the long line, um, and it's really important. What you know, and you, what I'm trying to say is, you do get situations like that where it's this really silly, repetitive thing in training with a young pup, and there is you do want to be careful and handle it the best you possibly can to make sure you're not developing a, um, a routine or a repetition that's going to somehow think, think that your pup's going to think that every time you stand on the long line it has to sit and then that somehow rolls over and just stop drill or something strange comes of it. But it's very common that you do get in this position where you really have to be patient and just repeat something over and over and over till the pup finally learns and sometimes it can take a while. So um, my note on this is don't worry about it super early days and it will smooth out. Um, really occasionally you have a, we'll have a case where 
a, an anomaly shows up and something happens. So let us know if that happens. But yeah, I I wouldn't overthink that at all. And um, that sort of thing's really common. And I'd just keep giving it the go command and let it pick it up. You know. Um, the second issue we have is we live in an urban environment. And I'm just gonna I'm gonna take a real quick break here. Be back in a moment. I'm back. Sorry, drunk too much water. Right, back to Rebecca's second question here. The second issue we have is we live in an urban environment and are doing one to two 15 to 20 minute training sessions a day. We don't have any other dogs for him to play with during his freedom sessions. And if we just leave him in the yard... He barks at the door and wants us to play with him or digs and eat sticks. Obviously, he needs some stimulation during these freedom sessions and something to do. What have others been doing in this situation? What do you suggest? Thanks so much in advance. Thanks, Rebecca, for the question. Um, long, relaxed walks. Um, yep, we've talked about this, but um, that's... That's it. So you're saying you're doing one to two 15 to 20 minute sessions a day. And if the if the pup or dog needs more than that and you're having issues basically trying to give them a freedom session in the backyard, that, that whole thing should improve as your pup or dog gets older. It definitely will improve and it will get bang on until you can just leave the pup or dog free around the house. Um as long as you've got a dog proof section. But at the stage you're at, if you're having issues with it, the best thing is just um, stretch those 15 to 20 minute training sessions out. Um, I think one to two 15 to 20 minute training sessions where you're actually, it's pretty structured and you're doing your stop drills and things more than that, once you get up around four or five, it can get too much and too regimented. Um, but what you can do and what's really good is you just stretch them right out. And, and so do a big, long walk. Um, for me, it would look like um, trying to go down the beach at a quiet, at a more quiet time. And, and when Miko was a pup, taking her for a big, long walk down the beach. And again, the rule here is whether I'm doing a 10-minute training session or a hour and 10 minute I'm only doing about five or six stop drills you know maybe a few more in the hour one but point being if I'm doing five or six stop drills in 15 minutes it doesn't mean I'm doing 20 in an hour I'm stretching them right I'm stretching the pauses right out but we're just walking you know um, here I'm really lucky we've got the beach, I've got big areas of sand dunes, I've got massive big parks, we've got bike tracks right through town and all sorts of stuff. I can do huge big loops with the dogs and and but I just have to be really selective about where I go and when in certain phases of training with certain dogs, you know. Um, I can, you know, go into situations that are making it more difficult for myself and the dog, mainly around distractions. Um, but that's what I recommend for that, just trying to get in a, in a decent area where there's not too many distractions. Just go for a walk, just keep walking. Um, once you get that pup walking in front and you're using the long line, um, just keep walking. <coughs> um, Dave's back. Forgot about this. Um, Dave, sorry, Paul, one new update and question. Blue is now four months old. We have just started part three. Just started the turn command a week ago. She knows what to do but seems reluctant to walk in front when turned and go in the opposite way and we're heading... When turned... She knows what to do. <laughs> I'm starting all over again. Just started the turn command a week ago. She knows what to do 
but seems reluctant to walk in front when turned and going the opposite way that we were heading originally. My answer is yep, that's exactly what every dog is like and you're working with a four month old pup and training it so you have to be patient and help the pup as much as possible and guide it through it as it learns and work through each step in training. So yep, when that's the whole they do. When you turn, they slow down. Change of direction is part of slowing the dog down and getting it to walk slow and close right in front. So when you change direction, you're walking back the other way, the dog does walk slower and closer. And then when you turn back around, they walk slower and closer too, and then they'll speed up, and then you do another turn, which slows everything down. So that's the answer. Yep, that's exactly what every dog is like. And that's what you're supposed to do. And... You need to be patient and work through it and help the dog learn. She also tends to play up, grab the long line, growl, bark, be silly. And my answer is that's all probably a product of everything else that we've talked about earlier. And this is exactly why you need to set up the right relationship and bond with your dog that is calm and positive and not conflict based. Otherwise, you'll have problems like this in everything that you do. Oh, Dave, Dave says, she seems to be waiting to go back the other way, and I say, yep, that's exactly what she's doing. Then she often plays up again. I normally, I normally slowly try to grab the long line because if I move fast, she thinks I'm playing and growl her while checking long line to stop it or alternatively bend down and put my hand down and call her to me and then try working again. This first method that seems to work better. Just wondering what your thoughts were and is this reasonably common, so thanks in advance. My answer, you can't be getting into that much conflict with your dog. You're looking at it all wrong. You should be patting her when she's walking slowly in front and that's in the blueprint. When your pup would... The whole blueprint is about teaching a pup or dog to walk slow and close right in front. You're turning your dog and getting into conflict while she's walking slow and close right in front. You should be patting her while she's walking slow and close right in front. You should be like, good girl. We, uh, and that's later on in the blueprint too. I talk about when you do all those turns and that and the dog slows right down. Now we're in a position where we can actually pat the dog while it's in front of us, and we do that with print, and that's perfect. That's called a face up in sheepdog training, and it's a very coveted and arguably difficult to get trait as a dog that is comfortable to walk slow and close right in front to the and and the bond and relationship is so good that they'll actually randomly stop, and you can give them a pat on the bum instead of going, hurry up, carry on, or doing, or doing anything else. So you're killing me, Dave. <laughs> Luke. Hi, Paul, two questions. Do you think 15 to 20 minutes in the dog box on the ute on the way home from a training area is enough kennel time before being let out for free time? My notes is no, still do the 30 minutes in the kennel. Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. Training session, 15-minute drive home, straight into a freedom session, no. Straight home, straight into the kennel for half an hour. And if you want to give them a freedom session, do it real, I'll break it right up, man. It's blue, It's getting a little bit. And usually if it's like, do you think it's a little, it probably is. Have you got any tips to help discourage the dog from losing her attention on flies or just pressure and praise? Oh, my note here is just pressure and praise. Uh, sorry, I'll read this again. Have you got any tips to help discourage the dog from losing her attention on flies or just pressure and praise? My notes are just pressure and praise, man and try to get your dog to focus on you through good training. Try not to train in places and at times where there are lots of flies if it's turning into a serious issue. 
this is rewritten. This uh, there was quite a lot more on this, um, but long story short, this dog's getting a little bit touchy around flies. It's it's um, you know in the middle of a stop drill if a fly flies past the dog forgets about the stop drill and is too more worried about the fly. Uh, and that's rolling over into shooting drills. And my note here is sometimes that fly thing is because the dog has been stung by a bee and it hasn't worked out that flies aren't bees. It can be a biggie man. Um, I had a dog go basically completely crazy with the fly thing. The dog, it was a rehome and the dog was already pretty crazy and it come to me with the fly thing. And um, it was, yeah, it, it was it was a pretty big problem, man. It got, and it, that got worse real quick. Um, and it's something that you do need to be fairly freaking careful about and you need to be patient with it. And, and, and uh, that's just a warning there that really rare, very, very rare, but I have seen some, uh, I was about to say I have seen some dogs go around the bend over flies, but I think it's dogs that have already gone around the bend, crazy, um, no training, no structure, no leadership, no job, just a dog in town um, with everything being done wrong and nothing to do and they and they go crazy and get neurotic and get weird and they just go crazy man it's like a it's like a crazy person you know how people can go crazy um if uh if you know if you lock a person in a freaking cell and treat them like crap for a really long time they literally turn into a crazy pe- person the same thing can happen with a dog and it and it's uh sometimes it's surprising how easily it can happen and it's pretty crazy how often it does happen and it's pretty crazy how often it does happen and people don't even realise it's happening and they laugh about it and oh my dog's doing this or look at her or look at him but and they're like looking they're laughing at a dog that's been crazy because they've made it crazy see it all the time and it's often laughed at until something bad happens um, but yeah it's getting a bit side tangent here, but um, I've seen the fly thing get a bit weird, man. I've seen it get really weird. So I would just be, just pressure and praise. I would be firm on it as far as um, I wouldn't let my dog um, I wouldn't coddle it, you know. I wouldn't let it like get off up off a stop, thinking, "Oh no, it's a fly." Oh, and he doesn't like flies, so I won't be too hard on him with the fly. I'd be like, "Hey, I did just that sort of thing." Like, if I've got a dog, and 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 a, it's on a stop drill, and a fly comes past, and the dog's like flipping out about the fly, it's the same thing as fireworks or stuff like that. Like, the, it's um, you don't want to go, no, it's all right, good dog, because that can be taken as you're praising the dog for being scared of the thing. Um, whereas my reaction is, hey, cut it out, sit down. That's Dogs don't understand, no, it's okay, you don't have to be scared of that. They don't understand it, there's no positive side to it. More often than not, it's it reinforces the negative behaviour towards the stimulus. Um, so what I'm saying is with the fly thing, I'd be pretty freaking firm on it, man, and really consistent and really black and white. No, you're not allowed to react like that to the fly to the point where if it was a stop drill and my dog got up, I'd be very fast, I'd want to be bang on with my timing and I'd want to be I just want to be super onto it on top of it and sorting it out because I have seen it turn into an issue 
particularly with a hunting dog, when you're talking about outdoor environments, um, flies, and then you talk about shooting a deer in summer and how many flies can be associated with that sometimes when you, as soon as you shoot it, there's just flies everywhere and then you're gutting it and butchering it and there's flies everywhere. I have that cr- that crazy dog that had the crazy thing with flies that really reared its head when I, st- and it didn't happen for, I had it for months and months. And then summer rolled around and I started hunting with it and this crazy thing that it had with the flies reared its head and then it it got connected with hunting and deer um, and stinging nettle was mixed in the mix with that and I think it had a crazy thing with flies thinking they were bees or wasps that could sting it and then it got stung with stinging nettle while there were flies everywhere with the deer that I just shot and this thing just, it was already nuts, but that was a sh- huge issue. So what I'm saying is I'd be super diligent with it. I'd be aware of the fact that it can turn into quite a serious issue, particularly with a hunting dog. You should be able to, I'd be careful with it around the gun. If you're doing, st- you know, if you if if the if it's becoming an issue, in your gun drills, I would remove the gun from the situation for now and get the fly situation sorted without the gun because depending on how serious it is, one thing you don't want to happen is that somehow the bullshit with the flies gets connected with the gun or anything to do with hunting. Um, so that's my advice on that is, yeah, pressure and praise is how you're going to deal with it. I'd be really hot on it. And if it's actually turning into something that you're like, man, this is actually turning into quite a thing here, I would go out of my way to set up situations or where there's a couple of flies around. Don't go out of your way to put the dog in a situation where there's a million flies. But I would go into situations where you know it's going to happen and I would try to deal with it there, separate of guns and scent and deer and everything. And, and I would be pretty freaking hard on it and I'd watch it relatively carefully and try to sort it out. Um, and yeah, it is just pressure and praise. Man, it's, ah, cut that out. When it's been a dork about a fly, then this, as soon as it relaxes and it's like being more normal while a fly is still there, you say good dog and pat it. And again, with these things... The more you, it comes back to what I was talking about, Hass with his dog in the helicopter, and he, he's trained her really well. Spends a lot of, he's in a cool situation where he can spend a lot of time with her, and they do a lot of stuff together. And um, and and I just, I feel like Hass has done, seems to have done a really good job with her. He's obviously got that dialed when he can. He was saying he was, we were talking about it in messages that yeah, I just put her in the heli. He was like, I couldn't believe it put her in the helicopter, she just sat there like she owned the thing, and then I took her out and she just sat beside me chill as while the helicopter took off and we were in full rotor wash. Couldn't believe it. Um, that's the thing, is once you get that bond and relationship set up, you can just steam walk through things like flies, more gunfire, a river crossing or a any weird situation that pops up, often, not all the time, I'm not saying that if your dog's scared of flies, it's because you don't have the right relationship with it. You might have a great relationship with your dog, but you're just having an issue with this thing. Often, though, weird thing, when things keep popping up with the dog, it's often because... The, that whole bond thing isn't quite right or you've done the wrong thing at the wrong time or whatever it is. Um, but what I'm saying here is is it's amazing how bulletproof you get when you understand everything properly and, and, and you're doing everything properly with a dog and you've got that bond set up right. As different situations arise and things like... Like print is unbelievable in steep country. Um, what I mean by that, he's actually not that good in steep country as far as climbing it, but I can say print, 
I can be hanging on to the side of a cliff with a leg wrapped around a tree root and say, print, come here, and <laughs> like grab him, drag him up, lay him, sit him on my chest and like bench press him up and over the top, and he's just like happy. He's like, oh, boss is helping me out. I'm sweet here. He's never flailing or stiff or awkward. He just goes with it and just like, uh, you know, he's never been an issue in a helicopter. Um, vehicles, the boat, Again, you just you just become bulletproof, and and you can just your dog will just follow you through anything. Um. Anyway, uh, so yeah, man, I hope that makes sense, and you can work through that, um, and just let us know on any of the stuff, man. Let us know, you know, Dave. Let us know. <laughs> Don't be scared to ask another question. Um. I'll. I'll always be honest and say what I think, but I'm always open to any question as long as you're open to the answer. Uh, here's another one. I don't have a name on this. Hopefully you recognise the question. Hi, Paul. I just purchased the blueprint. I'm going through all the videos in the blueprint first before I do anything. That's awesome. People tend to do very well when they do that. Get the blueprint before you even get a dog. Part one helps you how to choose a dog. Watching the whole thing will help you how to choose a dog. Um, the more you watch, the more you understand, the easier it is, and the less you're reacting to stuff earlier than you should because you know you're going to sort it out later and heaps of stuff. Watching the blueprint in advance and watching way ahead is great. Uh, the only thing that is concerning me... Oh, I, I also like, oh, I haven't got a puppy yet, but I'm leaning towards a German white hair pointer. I also like the Catahoula Hound. The only thing that is concerning me is that when I do get a, my pup home, there will be most probably another young pup around at the same time that another family member wants to get, but is not interested in, in doing the blueprint or any structured training or kenneling of any sort. Just sit, come, stay, but that's it. So how will me having another pup at home not following the blueprint or any structured training affect my pup? Will my pup get jealous seeing the other pup? No, nah, it won't. Dogs don't really think like that. Um... I feel like I'll be having to always be telling my dogs off and giving the no command so much more than normal and that th at the end I'm not going to get the same results. <clears throat> I'm looking for, as I do want my dog to be a great family member but also be that dog that can jump in the car in a heartbeat ready to go on the hunt with me. Also, if anyone has had this issue, let me know, thanks. I'll elaborate on this, but my note on this is um, you'll be fine, and if you do it properly, you'll have everyone wanting to have the other dog like your dog, which is quite common. Um, as long as no one's going out of their way, and as long as you're not like trying to do your one-on-one -on, -one on the back lawn with your pup and whoever's got the other pup, has their pup just like charging around the back lawn and like literally running into your training session, knocking your pup over and being a, if, if you can at least say, hey, can you give me 10 minutes on the back lawn with my pup? I'm just doing this training session. And you're not in such a shitty situation that like they won't even do that. Um, as long as you can do that, as long as, basically as long as you can follow the blueprint, so as long as you can get those sessions in in a low distraction environment, as long as you can do the kenneling, um, as long as you can follow the blueprint, you'll be fine. And it doesn't really matter what someone else does with their dog around you. Um, <laughs> what, what, what could possibly happen and what we have had happen with this exact situation because we've had this question a bit when, hey, I'm getting a pup, but my 
brothers just got a pup at the same time and or my sister and they're not training it and I want to do the blueprint with a pup and I give that exact answer. As long as you can stick to your stuff and their pup doesn't directly interfere with your one-on-one time with your pup when you need that low distraction, um, it won't matter. And we've had it like, I've had that question and then four months later, like, hey, what's the Palmico dog guy? Because everyone's seeing how my pup's turning out and now my sister wants to train her dog. Or a year later, um, the same thing, or just comments like, hey, now that I did the blueprint and this other person didn't, the other person wishes that they did, that they did do better training. Um, so that's the answer, man. I think you'll be fine and you'll probably just set a good example, if I'm being honest. Um, that's it, everybody, for the Q&A. Thanks, everyone, for the questions. Thanks, everyone, that signed up to the Deer Dog Training Blueprint and the Palmico Dog Guide. Uh, if you want to find out more about the Deer Dog Training Blueprint or the Palmico Dog Guide, the Palmico Dog Guide is our general dog training video series for non-hunters that want to follow our same training principles. You can go to biggameindicatingdogs.com for the Deer Dog Training Blueprint. You can go, you can check out Big Game Indicating Dogs on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. You can check out my personal stuff, Paul John Michaels, on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, if you want more, if you're watching this on YouTube and you want some more hunting podcasts, the Paul John Michaels podcast on YouTube. If you're listening to this on my podcast, the Paul John Michaels podcast, you, you're you already here. Um, if you're watching this on Big Game Indicating Dogs YouTube, you can go to the Paul John Michaels podcast on YouTube and listen to more hunting podcasts. Uh, for the Palmico stuff, you can go to palmicodogtraining.com. Otherwise... Thank you, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks, everybody.